the Automated Podcast. Welcome back to Automated. My name is Mark Verbenkov, and this, of course, is the podcast exploring the impact of technology on jobs. And today we'll be looking at the sharing economy, but I wanted to start off by actually continuing off of a news article from last week. And that's the article about uh, the retirement of Lee Sedol. This is the world's go grandmaster, the uh, 18-time world champion, and as many say, the best player of the last several decades. So as I mentioned last week, he retired as a professional Go player um, because he deemed the AI systems are now actually unbeatable. So with that news in mind, a friend and I actually went and played our first Go match. If you've never played it, it's quite similar to chess in its uh, intense focus and amount of strategy and calculations that are needed for every single move. We actually ended up playing for about three to four hours and we weren't even able to finish our first match as we were becoming really mentally exhausted and started to make a number of basic and small mistakes. But we both really started to understand how powerful an AI system actually is. So based on how much we had to concentrate and really understanding that Lee Sedol could absolutely destroy either one of us, knowing that an AI system can now even beat him every single time was pretty eye-opening. So for any one of you interested, I really recommend you go play a game of Go or even chess if you haven't done so before and do this against an evenly matched opponent. And after an intense match of focusing and calculating as much as you can, I think it's good to sit back and think about how easily a modern AI system could beat you. I think it's a pretty humbling experience. So one final point on this topic, Um, another friend of mine recommended a really good documentary called AlphaGo, uh, which is a great exploration of the five match set between AlphaGo and Lee Sedol in 2016. I'll have a link in the show notes if you're interested in seeing a little bit about how the system was developed and more importantly, Lee's reaction to playing against the AI system. So I wanted to bring this up because in a very short clip, Lee describes the value that he got from the matches. So even though he was the best in the world and had been practicing intensely on the game since he was about nine years old, he said that even he learned something profound about Go from his match with AlphaGo, the AI system. So I thought this was really interesting to hear as it might be a small signal about how we might benefit from AI systems in the future. So even though we probably won't be able to compete on most tasks, we might find still profound value and insights from our digital counterparts. I think it'll be really interesting to see how things play out. But let's move on to today's topic, the sharing economy. So what exactly is the sharing economy? I think by now most people have already used services like Uber or Airbnb, which are the two big names within the sharing economy. So the sharing economy allows individuals and groups to make money from underutilized assets. So idle assets such as uh, parked cars and spare bedrooms can be rented out when not in use. In this way, these physical assets are shared as services. So typically these assets are publicized on online platforms specific to that asset type. And because the owners are making use of something already owned, most rates are typically cheaper than their competition, which has really propelled the sharing economy over the last decade or so. So for a bit of perspective, the sharing economy only had a few platforms back in 2009, like BlaBlaCar and Couchsurfing, which you've probably heard of. And in 2014, it was estimated to be around 15 billion US dollars across the world but it's predicted to be over 300 billion by 2025. So as I mentioned, Uber and Airbnb are the big names of the industry, where both rides and apartments are shared in a peer-to-peer interaction. But what are some other examples? So over the past two years, many cities have seen uh, this boom of electric scooters. So there are now sharing schemes in hundreds of cities across the world. And just one company called uh, Bird and Lime itself has sharing schemes in over 100 cities. But of course, there are still shared bike systems across the world's cities. And this, in fact, started all the way back in 1965 in Amsterdam, though within less than a month, 
the unlocked bikes had either been stolen or destroyed or even thrown in a number of the canals across the city. Today, however, these bike sharing systems are massive and the biggest one in Wuhan, China has around 90,000 bikes. I personally use the BCN stations here in Barcelona and I think it's great, it's easy and convenient to get around and to drop off or pick up bikes. But looking at more innovative approaches, we see that there is a further support for implementing shared systems. So in the Netherlands, not too far from Amsterdam, the city of Rotterdam is moving forward with a new housing project that will have four shared vehicles that come with the new housing complexes. So this means that a shared transportation model is being built into the living arrangements of people living there. So though transportation is perhaps the most visible system to anyone living in urban areas, there are also co-working spaces that have grown with the boom of the startup and freelance industry. This is where multiple startups or digital nomads share one large office space and typically get a number of the services that you would get with a large office space, such as a shared meeting room or a teleconference center or other things like this. So even platforms that focus on fashion and clothing exist where individuals can sell or even rent their clothes. So this has grown with the kind of fast fashion trend and one company called uh, Rent the Runway has over 6 million members that can choose from some 200,000 pieces of clothing, jewelry and accessories. And they can actually use these for up to four days before uh, returning them for free. And this is even without them requiring to do the dry cleaning for the uh, clothes. So though this company has some 800 million US dollars in turnover, one of the original platforms, eBay, still dwarfs this with some uh, $36.8 billion. So another interesting area where the sharing economy has moved into is in the peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. This is where individuals can lend money to entrepreneurs or other companies with typically cheaper rates than the traditional banking system has. I think the most well-known crowdfunding platform is Kickstarter, which has actually raised over $4.5 billion for some 175,000 projects. And actually 400 of these have actually raised over $1 million. So you can see it's quite a powerful platform for entrepreneurs and new companies to uh, generate a little bit of capital to start off their activities. So my personal favorite example of the sharing economy has to do with the sharing of resources. So this is similar to the library model where you can borrow certain resources from a centralized space. So I supported the setting up of uh, Montreal's first tool library some five years ago, where typical uh, power tools could be rented for specific projects or home repair for a few days or weeks, and then they are returned, enabling others to use the tools rather than buying a specific tool for a specific job, and then just having it collect dust in a garage for several years, if not forever. So the idea was actually inspired by a Paris art library where you could go and rent a painting for a few weeks before returning it and getting a new one. So there are now several platforms that enable this across North America, Europe, and parts of Asia. And the tool libraries are also a growing movement of sorts across the world. So though the sharing economy is a powerful tool, it is not without its fair share of criticism. So regulatory uncertainty is perhaps the largest criticism as unlicensed individuals that offer services may not be following already in place regulations and they can avoid the associated costs. So a good example of this is uh, here in Barcelona. We've had a number of day long or even weekend long taxi strikes, which has essentially shut Uber out from entering the city due to the unfair nature of the platform. So here in Barcelona, as in most other cities, taxi drivers need to pay for an expensive license before they're able to take rides. Whereas with Uber, drivers do not need to do this, and the onboarding experience to become a driver is relatively simple in comparison. So this puts uh, the Uber driver at a financial advantage, while many also argue that they provide a better service due to the ability to hail a ride simply from your smartphone. Additionally, no government oversight leads to a number of certain precarious situations. 
So with the rating system in place on most platforms, for example, a driver is incentivized to be more pleasant and potentially offer better service as the rating is linked to that individual directly. Whereas with taxi drivers, they are anonymous and can easily get away with being rude or unfriendly or even cheat a customer by having extra distances or price added without any real repercussions. However, there are loads of actual crazy Airbnb stories where apartments get completely trashed or even flooded, uh, hidden cameras have been found in rooms, to even having uh, guests being killed. So the review system certainly isn't perfect. So there's also fear that the greater amount of information being shared on an online platform can create racial and gender bias among users. So this can happen when users are allowed to choose who they will share their home or vehicles with, or because of implicit uh, statistical discrimination by certain algorithms that don't select users with characteristics such as poor credit history or even criminal records. So for example, Airbnb has had to face uh, racial discrimination complaints from African American and Latino uh, would-be renters due to a widespread preference not to rent to these specific customers. So with limited government oversight, there is already the issue of platforms being able to take advantage of those using it. So Uber has specifically been in the news recently as their drivers are considered self-employed or even contractors, enabling the company to essentially have no drivers as employees, enabling Uber to avoid paying wages, insurance, and health costs, while simultaneously putting the burden and risk on those individuals using their cars. So many full-time drivers have actually gone on strike this year, proclaiming that they aren't able to make a living wage. And at least in the UK, Uber now has to pay drivers for a national living wage. So I think it's pretty easy to see that the sharing economy will have quite a large impact if it's not already having a large impact on our society and economy already. But what exactly will its impact be on jobs? So according to a 2008 study, it was found that just the hotel industry accounts for more than one in 25 jobs just in the US. So though the industry is growing and more job openings exist every single year, the combination of Airbnb and other new platforms offering the same sharing services have been taking potential customers. So some 150 million room nights were actually offered in 2019 just with Airbnb. So this, along with the growing automation within hotels, to the point of fully automated hotels, like the one that opened in China in 2018, will impact the large job supply and industry. The issue is even more profound within transportation. So for industrialized nations, this accounts for nearly 10% of all jobs. And the jobs connected to the production of vehicles in particular will be put under pressure with both the sharing economy as well as autonomous vehicle technology, which when combined enables access for more people with fewer required vehicles. And just as an interesting fact here, most vehicles spend 95% of their lifetime in parking lots. So this is kind of the perfect place for the sharing economy to have an impact. So it's already known that vehicle manufacturers across the world are concerned about the future diminishing need for individual ownership of the vehicles that they produce right now. And I think that this mindset generally encapsulates the future thinking of the shared economy in that as it becomes more and more prevalent, there will be less need or demand to actually own the things that we use day to day. I really think that we're starting to see the shift towards an access-based economy rather than an ownership-based economy. Though it might be an overall slow shift, I think that there are disruptions that happen rapidly. So you can think of uh, media streaming services and specifically Netflix that only started to stream media in 2010 and the level of dominance that it attained in only a few short years with its now uh, 7,000 plus employees. In contrast to this, Blockbuster, at its peak in 2004, employed over 84,000 people worldwide and only six years later filed for bankruptcy. 
So this is a theme that has come up in the podcast a number of times so far in that new displacing industries require fewer people to perform better services. And it is a theme that will be interesting to follow as the sharing economy continues to grow to support an access economy. So that's it for this episode. Um, also, as a bit of a news point, as the holidays are coming up, I'll actually be going back to Canada for almost a month. So next week's episode will be the last for a few weeks. But I hope to maybe have a uh, Christmas special episode during the holidays, but we'll definitely be back in mid-January, where the episodes will transition away from uh, the specific technologies that I've been looking at and more into the core of the impacts and solutions of the trend of automation. So thanks for listening and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you haven't done so already, you can also subscribe through the automatedpodcast.org website. Thanks for listening. The Automated Podcast.